This is the Free Heal Life Podcast, episode number 35. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Heal Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. And we're back for another weekly edition of All Things Telemark. And I've got a few newsroom items and notes. Uh, (laughs) I've been trying to dig harder and harder these last few weeks until we start seeing some cold and some stuff happening up here in the Northern Hemisphere. But I did look into uh, some of the stuff down south and found a little bit. It looks like as far from what I've heard so far, uh, New Zealand seems to be looking the best out of everybody. Uh, I found the Ski Area Association New Zealand, SANS is their acronym, Uh, And they have worked with the Ski Resorts, Ministry of Business, Innovation, and Employment, and WorkSafe to ensure minimum standards to manage COVID-19 risk during alert level two. There is like an entire report online if you want to kind of, if you're interested in any of that kind of stuff to see what uh, they're doing in New Zealand, that might be a good place to start. I thought it was pretty interesting, actually. I didn't read the entire report, but it looks like they're rocking and rolling down there. Uh, I spoke to a friend down in Argentina. Uh, they just opened in Bariloche, uh, the resort there, but only locals are allowed to go, and that's it. Um, the resort just outside of there, Catedral. You can go there, but only for locals until like August or something like that, and then they're going to try it. So we'll see how long that lasts. Um, and then as far as... Australia, like I mentioned, there's some closures down there at False Creek and Hotham. And I'm not sure about the other ones uh, in Perisher and some of those other ones. But anyways, something to watch if you're interested in that sort of thing. I am because obviously we run a shop and I'm kind of curious to see how it all goes in other places. Uh, As far as social media, got that back up and running last week and started posting some stuff, digging up some powder shots, some powder videos. If you need some stoke to kind of cool things off and you're in the summer heat, uh, YouTube's a great place to go check out. There's a bunch of full length movies on there. There's some playlists put together. You can geek out on some gear and whatnot. And if you want to find uh, shop stuff at free Hill life on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at Telly Skier Mag on Instagram, and you can find Telemark Skier Magazine on YouTube, and that's kind of the YouTube's kind of where we sort of merge all things shop, magazine, everything else. Try to keep it as simple so there's not as many places for you guys to have to go dig around for stuff. But uh, those are the few news items I've got. Uh, our episode today is with a gentleman by the name of Ken Emmerich. And Ken is one of the founders of the Summit Telemark series, one of the premier Telemark race series in the late 1970s and 80s. It was started in Summit County, Colorado, and quickly spread to multiple resorts in the state and beyond. And he's currently teaching skiing at Winter Park, Colorado, and lives in Golden, Colorado. And I am super excited to have him here today and can't wait to get this thing going. All right, Ken, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for inviting me. It's good to be here. I'm I'm stoked, and it's it's fun to have uh, some of you old-timers get on here and, and uh, school me in where all of this uh, stuff came from. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, Well, no matter, no matter where we go, here we are. I know. I love that. So um, I, I guess kind of just to hop right into it um, – if you can kind of like, where are, are you from Colorado originally? Well, I was an air force brat. My dad, uh, moved the whole family here to Colorado in, in 1965 and I was 10 and immediately first winter, we all got into Alpine skiing and we met a, a gentleman that ran a program for kids. That was a ski school. And he took, I think there was four buses up to a basin full of, I think each bus held either 25 or 30 kids. And my parents drove their family station wagon as the ambulance. 
So every Saturday oh, wow. we piled wow. five kids in the car with mom and dad and went to a basin over Loveland Pass. And the tunnel wasn't there yet. The interstate wasn't there yet. So we went to a basin and did what we did. We all took lessons for the first couple of years that were part of their uh, program in exchange for them driving the family wagon as an emergency vehicle. We all got lessons and my four brothers and I or three brothers and I uh, just started skiing with an instructor every Saturday. Oh, so we did that, for, did that for a couple of years and uh, it kind of cemented the relationship in me. I mean, I got into it big time. My brothers were, eh, they all got into it. And of course, being the youngest, I was chasing them and trying to keep up and that didn't take long. Um, you know, we always did everything together. So it was like, you know, keep up or go home and I couldn't go home. So I kept up. <laughs> That's amazing. That's actually pretty funny to think. So was it like with the family station wagon? Did it look like a station wagon or was it like one of the old, uh, like, Oh one? yeah. Family station wagon, Rambler ambassador. Oh wow. You know, it had, it had, uh, a bench seat in the front and the back and a third seat in the way back where we put our boots and stuff, our <laughs> so, equipment. So if they needed and, to uh, transport someone from a base and they basically just would put them in there and they would drive them down to Denver. Exactly. We'd put them <laughs> in the back. And I think that probably happened. That probably happened four times in two years. Wow. And then the third year, the third year, my older brothers were in high school, the two oldest ones. And my next brother and I were in middle school, junior high school, seventh and eighth grade. And they gave us the option. If you wanted to go, you could go. If, if not, and you had something else to do, you could go to some friend's house. You set that up in advance. So my older brothers kind of were there hit and miss. They were there part-time. I was full-time. I was absolutely into it. If I was going to get to ski for free on, on every Saturday, man, I was in that vehicle at 6 o'clock and I was ready to go. That's so awesome. That uh, that must have been quite the adventure too. Because I've my mom, uh, my mom's from Denver, and she used to talk about before they put the Eisenhower Tunnel in how it was driving over that pass, and it sounded pretty, pretty different times. For oh, sure. we we definitely we definitely had some interesting stories to tell. Uh, I'll tell you one short one. Long story made short. We're in a whiteout blizzard, stopped bumper to bumper over the pass to get to a basin first thing in the morning. You know, it's light out, but we could barely see, you know, 10 feet in front of us when it was good. And otherwise, it was just a whiteout and you couldn't see anything. You're stopped. And, of course, five kids in the car and mom and dad. And inevitably, the you know, fact comes up, you got to go. And <laughs> dad, I got to go. He said, well, climb over your brothers and get out the this leeward side of the car on this side of the car, driver's side. He said, get out and just kneel down there and do your business. And, of course, I got out of the car and stood up and immediately got blown off my feet and went to the other side of the road oh, into no. the snowbank. And the snowbank is there. There's no cars coming. It's all stopped. There's nobody there. But it blew me right across the road into the, <laughs> to the snowbank. And I kneeled there and peed in the snowbank, crawled back to the car and got in the car. And one by one, my brothers did the same thing. And we were there for about an hour. Oh, my gosh. And we got to a basin and skied all day and bitter cold weather and howling winds and you know, that was another adventure we did that just about every weekend and some great some weekends the weather was great other weekends it was 20 below you know jeez you just never never know what you're gonna get yeah no that's i love i love stories like that it reminds me of like road trips yeah before you had anything to look at <laughs> except a book maybe or something <laughs> Well, you've heard those old stories about the kid that says, yeah, we we walked four miles to school uphill both ways in a snowstorm, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, my, my wife did in Norway. She had to go uphill from her house and then down to the schoolhouse. And then at the end of the day, she had to go up the hill again and then back down to her house on the other side. Oh, geez. We're soft. In Northern we're, Norway. we're getting that soft. That was Nar <laughs> Narvik, Norway. Narvik, right? Norway. Oh, I love that. Um, in the dark. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it, man, and that is, yeah, the darkness is no joke. I I remember the last time I was in Norway, and and it was, I think we went in January, and I could, that was the first time I had ever experienced that. You know, it's like one p.m. and it's dark. <laughs> I was like, this is pretty weird, very strange. Definitely, definitely plays with your psyche when uh, you get three hours of daylight, not sunlight, but daylight. Uh, you know, in the winter time, we were there about seven years ago. 
we got there on the 19th of December on the you know, 21st, the shortest day. I think we had just a little over two hours of daylight. And it was just wow. like dusk. It wasn't really light, light. But we got up in the morning and put our gear on and went hiked and climbed up the mountain and went to the top. And it was light for about two hours in the middle of the day, uh, maybe 11 to 1. And halfway down, we're in total darkness again, headlamps on, and we got home at about 5. And we had been walking in the darkness since 9 in the morning. Yeah, that's a, such a different vibe, that's for sure. It is. Well, I guess Alaska can be that way. I just haven't been there in the winter to see. Yeah, me either. Yeah, I've been later in the spring. Um, well, okay, so going back to, to growing up skiing, it sounds like you kind of stuck with it into high school and stuff. Did Were, were there like ski clubs or uh, race teams or what What exactly? Did you, did you get into anything that was kind of like more organized that way or were you just free I skiing? Did. No, I did. I was the only one of the four boys that got into racing and got into the ski club program. I had some buddies that I went to junior high school with, and one of the kids' grandfather owned a cabin up in Breckenridge. Nice house. Uh, it looks like a nice house now, but when as kids, we were told it was a cabin. But it was you know, a really nice place in Breckenridge, and there weren't that many really nice places in Breckenridge back in the mid-60s. So it was pretty new, and... Uh, his mom would drive up every Friday afternoon, so we'd leave our skis up there, and we'd drive up Friday afternoon uh, after school. We'd have dinner and go to bed and get up and go train. Uh, well, Breckenridge Ski Club was what it was at the time, and that was eighth grade and ninth grade. And then in high school, he got into something else, and I started driving, and i just stick with it. And then I went through that program through high school, uh, and it was, you know, back then we raced all three disciplines. Super G didn't exist, so we raced slalom, giant slalom, and trained downhill and raced about two races a year. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was I was a little guy, didn't have much weight, not a lot of strength, but I was quick on my feet. So slalom and GS were my my thing. Downhill just scared the pee out of me, and <laughs> and uh, I, I remember I remember a, a downhill at Aspen Mountain in high school and. Geez, just standing there watching when we were sectioning the course. These guys, the the best guys came by, and they were hitting this hole, and it just got bigger and bigger and bigger every time one of them would come by. And and that was just, you know, doing our sectioning the day before. And, uh, gosh, there was a coach from Aspen came down. He said, you guys get out of here. He said, well, no, we're watching. We need to find out where our line is. And he said, no, I don't want you watching. He said, you're going to see too much stuff that you shouldn't be seeing. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, the next guy comes down and just wrecked big time because he hit this hole. And so we thought, well, we got to stay away from that. And so we did. And we just went slow through that section and picked our line. So we avoided the hole. But yeah, on the, the race day came and the first two guys, the two guys that I was with that drove over from Breckenridge, first guy went and then there was a hold on the course. So I knew he crashed. And then Jim went. Jim was a little stocky downhiller, and he was very good at speed, but he didn't have. He wasn't very adept at uh, quick turns. At any rate, he had the same thing happen. He's somewhere on the course. He crashed and bailed out. Um, lost his skis, from what I understand later. And uh, so I hear this, and I'm you know ten racers behind him, and you know I'm running about fifty out of eighty. And because I wasn't, I didn't have any points in downhill. And sure enough, I get all the way to the very last bump. I can literally see the finish line, and I wrecked and landed face first at about fifty miles an hour, and, oh, and uh, blew my shoulder up, cut my face all up, and they dragged me off the course. And <laughs> the coach from Taos dragged me off the course, and I sat there. And the patrol came down and untied my bib. And when they moved my elbow to untie my bib, because we had tie-ons back then. When he moved my elbow, my shoulder came back into joint, and then I oh, could feel. It. And then, yeah. then it hurt. So <laughs> oh, he walks geez. me over to the side of the course, and I get my skis, and I walk through the parking lot. We're right at the bottom of Tie Hack. It was called the Tie Hack downhill. And uh, get to the bottom, walk over to the car, and sitting in the car is the other guy that ran first, and he wrecked and wrecked his left shoulder. So his right arm was good. I get in the car and I wrecked my right shoulder. So my left arm was good. We're driving his dad's four speed suburban and he's steering with his right hand and oh, I'm shifting with my I, left I, hand. I knew that's where that was going. <laughs> it was, it was a disaster. We get, we get to the hospital. We're staying with the, 
the this kid's parents uh, were well his dad was a orthopedic surgeon for the u.s ski team so we're staying at the that dr o'dane's house there in aspen he was the orthopedic surgeon resident orthopedic surgeon that lived right there we get to the admitting building there and barbara i think her name was barbara o'dane comes to the door and she looks at us and she said oh my gosh i better make a phone call to cancel this race there was four other guys in the clinic Jeez. and that was from our non-stops <laughs> that wasn't even race day <laughs> oh, i think man. Ricky, ricky klein broke his back that day and i, don't, I can't remember who else get, was injured but there's about four or five of us that were admitted to the hospital with two of us with shoulder injuries one with a back and i don't know the other guys i can't remember what they what happened to them but knees or something broken leg but uh yeah we i went to the race the next day and watched from the the bottom sitting on the hay bales and my friend steve swalm won the thing and it was like holy cow that was it was fun to watch <laughs> definitely more fun to watch than it was to do it yeah because i was scared out of my wits yeah that sounds like some carnage that's uh brutal yeah you know being a kid that was a light kid that skied slalom and giant slalom you get in a fast downhill for the first time and it was a bumpy course and you know i didn't I, we didn't have specialty skis or anything like that we were running on our slalom giant slalom skis which was one pair of skis yeah totally <laughs> we, we didn't have downhills and you know didn't practice on downhill skis so it was uh it was pretty humorous in a way i mean looking back at it it, it was foolish but you know we were young yeah. We didn't know any better. Yeah, that's the best way to be. <laughs> get, get it out while you're young. I love it. Well, when, well enth enthusiasm beats the hell out of experience in some cases, and that wasn't one of them. <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. Well, what, so like getting through, obviously through high, so you were in high school in mid-60s then? Is that what you're no, saying? No, early 70s. 70s or early 70s. 70s, okay. Yeah. So w once you got out of high school, did the race stuff continue, and, and, and kind of where... I guess I mean we we kind of know that like Telemark kind of comes in the picture in the in the U.S. you know in the mid '70s somewhere. So like yeah. where where exactly did your journey with coming from racing and living in that area kind of intersect with with Telemark and and yeah all that's that? a that's a good question. That's a simple one, you know. And <clears throat> I was in uh, college seventy four, seventy five, seventy six. And I left college because in, at Fort Lewis, I went down there to ski race and I couldn't get on the ski team at CU, which was my first choice because they had one of the powerhouses in the country. And I walked on at Fort Lewis and I uh, was lucky enough. Uh, the coach uh, uh, obviously saw something that uh, he saw some potential. And he, after three months of hard training, he said, why don't you come train with us? Uh, I was training on my own in the fall. He said, why don't you come train with us and we'll see what happens. Maybe we can do something for you at Christmas time. And uh, so I did. And at Christmas time, he offered me a scholarship, which at that time was basically tuition and fees. Um, and it mounted to about $440. This is 1970, <laughs> 1974. Different, so, different times. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it wasn't uh, the scholarship that you think of that, you know, pays your way through college by any means. But you know, times were different. College wasn't expensive, as expensive back then. I think the the total amount for a, uh, we were on trimesters there at Fort Lewis. I think it was about 2800 2900 bucks for in-state. Anyway, my parents helped with the rest of it, and I paid the rest of it just with money I made in the summer. And went to school two years, and then they canceled the program because Title IX came in, and they couldn't fund men's and women's teams in all the sports, so they dropped skiing as a collegiate sport a funded sport and so when they dropped the ski team and that was uh at the end of 76 uh, christmas time he came to us and told us that you know we we're not going to have a program next year so you might look for options and where you might want to go if you want to ski and uh a few of the guys stayed there uh most of us left i left and came back home to dillon where i was living and uh was ski racing there and working at the resort um working in the race department doing races race coaching and uh, setting courses and i had an accident setting a course with a bunch of bamboo 75 pounds of bamboo on my shoulder oh. stupid thing but i was at my peak physically i was probably stronger than i'd ever been because i had been training and working out every day for six months and uh anyway i had a bad accident and basically sheared my knee off and 
ACL, MCL, PCL, LCL, and medial and lateral meniscus. And that same surgeon that used to be the ski team surgeon repaired me and fixed me up, but it was a year before I could even think about getting back on ski. So January of 77, I started cross-country skiing uphill. Mm. And that was really just for training. I was had been riding a bike since... I'm going to say after six months after the first surgery, which was January, I rode a bike all summer. And then that fall started training on cross country skis, just touring. And when the ski area opened and Keystone was the first one to have snowmaking, I would go up the access roads. Me and my friend who was my roommate, EJ Albright would ski with our dogs. I had a puppy and we'd ski up the access roads to the top of Keystone and come down the icy beginner slopes that uh, they had oh, big beginner and intermediate slopes that they had open and just had to figure out how to get down but we were on touring skis you know we didn't have any edges or anything and he had seen tele skiing from a buddy of his in crested butte that we grew up with and he said oh you gotta we gotta learn how to do this and geez i watched him and he was a big heavy set guy and he looked so elegant he could do this thing and i was watching and watching and watching i was trying and trying and trying and i could not put one foot behind me and put any weight on it because i was doing what i used to do as a racer staying forward and putting all my weight on that downhill ski and geez i couldn't get that uphill ski back there with weight on it so i was spinning out all the time and finally i was just parallel skiing i could do that that was easy I could skid like a champ, <laughs> but, but I couldn't make it till he turned to save my ass. any rate, uh, I watched EJ over and over and over, and we did this for months in 77. And then finally, towards the end of the season, we had a business league race over at Copper. Uh, there was a business league. That was what I was doing before when I was working for the resort and uh, the race department. And we went over to Copper to the business league and, Geez, I watched EJ, and I stood there after I fell once. I stood there and watched this guy come by me. And from the side, I finally saw what I needed to see. And that was equal distribution of weight from front to back without leaning forward, the hips right between the feet. And I could see he was putting his weight on the ball of the back foot, not pointing his toe and just sliding it back. But he was just shuffling his feet. So he was dropping his hips right in between his feet. So he had even weight on front and back ski. Hmm. And I thought, oh, man, that's it. So I followed him. I said, just go in front of me. I'll just follow you. And I followed him. He was making these nice, smooth, symmetric turns. And about 10 turns into it, it clicked. And it was like, I never looked back. Hmm. So, it was, so cool. it was definitely a visual that got me. And I understood mechanics of it from coaching and from teaching and from my coaches, training and racing. And when I saw it, it was just like, okay, now I see exactly what he's doing. And when I felt it, it was obvious that was it that's what i needed and then it was just like it became a passion i had to get better and better and better and <laughs> when i bought a bought a pair of europa 99s from the shop i was working with in breckenridge and uh, that was the beginning and the next month i think it was february of 77 gene dayton uh, put on this big event in breckenridge called the telemark returns oh yeah and, you were telling me about this this is and that was in 77 yeah and uh, Gene had this event they called Telemark Returns, and they had, you know, a little course up there the, on the Nastar Hill that uh, was about uh, 20, 25, 30 seconds, something like that. And that was just one part of it. They had an orienteering race for people that weren't into tele racing. They had an orienteering race where you started at the bottom and you had your orienteering map and you had your compass and you had your punch, and they had control set, set up all over the lower mountain from peak nine up to peak eight. And you went and stopped at these different orienteering stations and you had a team. So everybody got judged and scored on both time and accuracy of the orienteering. So that was fun. Wow. And they had, then they did clinics and the clinics were done by at that time, PSI examiners, professionals. That was Gene Dayton, Vic Haynes, um, Buck Elliott, Rick Borkovic, and maybe somebody else local there. Who else was it? Oh, the Kerfman brothers. Anyway, they were doing clinics, and I thought, man, that's cool. Uh, and the clinics were, nobody knew. There wasn't a defined progression at that time. So, you know, they were doing the best they could, but 
they didn't have a booklet or anything like that. And they were all very consistent in what they did. And it was the same message, you know, get your weight between both skis and, you know, lower your body so that you're stretching out your platform and making it hard to, you know, get tipped too far forward or too far back. But keep your weight between your feet and drive it with the inside ski, the downhill ski. Hmm. So we did that. And one thing led to another. And, geez, I think the second year, if I'm not mistaken, 78 or 79, it might have been, <clears throat> excuse me, it might have been 1980. We had 240 people showed up and registered for that event. Oh my God. That's And that's total. That's yeah. between the orienteering and the party and the on the mountain and the clinics and everything. So there was a lot that's of a- people that were just coming out of the woods because they were getting into cross country skiing and touring and they wanted to come out and learn how to tell you. Yeah, that's a that's a healthy event. I know when you told me that when we talked on the phone previously, I that was one event I had never even heard of. I mean, that like predates. That's probably like the first Telemark Festival. I mean, to be honest with you, no. it was. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Um, after that, it became you know a little small events. We started with you know a race at Copper, and they had some fun events at Crested Butte. I think Rick put on a couple of events, and they had tours and people you know it it evolved from that but that was that was also the year we really started the summit telemark series and that was instigated because in i believe it was 77 i'd have to check my check with bob kerfman it was either 77 or 78 i'm pretty sure it was 77 that we had the first kamikaze cup at copper hardy could probably vouch for that one i don't know where uh for sure he was at copper at that time so, it was based, so he, Kamikaze Cup was kind of a precursor event. Was it was that all Telemark as well, or was that? An you out? know, that was that's that's a good question too. There was no rules. <laughs> oh, so, oh, it was just I like say, st- everyone start at the top and go type of thing. It was it was a it was, the interesting thing about it, and it, it was the most fun. We had a little ten to twelve gate tele race and there was only about 10 or 12 of us there was four people from four to five from crested butte and about six or eight maybe 10 from summit county and we had this little tele race up that, there that was maybe 20 gates but it was hand timed you know you get out of the star gate and everybody was going for it and you know it wasn't it wasn't a big deal and it was fun and everybody was getting a second run the third round and wasn't running against your buddy uh, race them the first time and then switch courses and that was fun. But at the end of the day, um, at the end of the racing in the morning, Bob says, well, let's, let's have a race from the, we're going to have a race from the top to the bottom. And there was three control gates, but we, he did a, what they call a Le Mans start. So everybody went a hundred feet down the hill and you put your skis up top on the flat and everybody went down the hill about a hundred feet. And he, basically stood there and shot off a gun everybody takes off and runs up the hill jumps in their skis and takes off down the hill and there's three control gates at the top you had to go right left right and then it was a free for all to the bottom oh my gosh that sounds (laughs) epic (laughs) and it was funny because i was i don't know when we started i wasn't really you know i wasn't trying to go as fast as i could to get in my skis i was just going to pace where everybody else was going but i got in my skis pretty quickly so there was about six guys, maybe seven guys ahead of me, and we all took off, and there was no rule of telly you know, versus alpine or parallel style. You just went. And uh, I think the first gate, there was a couple of guys that spun out, and the second gate, there was one or two that spun out, and it's Artie and Lee Klinger and Clint Roberts. Art, Art Burroughs. Yeah. Yeah. Artie and Lee Klinger and Clint Roberts, I think, were in front of me. And I could see everything. It was like slow motion. I could see my tips fluttering, you know. I was in a tuck towards the bottom, and tips were fluttering, and one guy would hook up, and they'd be gone. Lee Klinger was the first one out. Then Clint Roberts. Then it's already been me, and I'm gaining on him. And I had a better line when we got near the flats at the bottom, and I went by him. And I could see just see my tips flapping in the soft snow, and, and it was just surreal. It was almost like slow motion. We got to the bottom, and I don't know, maybe I had him maybe by 10 seconds, but it must have been a two-minute, two-and-a-half-minute run. It and, was pretty fun. And this is it. Is, that was, is it Copper Mountain, you were saying? That was at Copper. Okay. And then that became an annual event, and then it moved over 
I don't know if you're familiar with copper at all, but uh, moved over from the eye lift side where it was first thrown at us um, because it was safer over there because it was a little bit flatter and there weren't nearly as many people. So we were safer and we didn't threat anybody else. Yeah. But then it moved over and they had to close a run for us. And that was, um, they moved over to Solitude Station. And we started at, you know, right there at Solitude, ran up, put our skis on and took off. And it was the first one to the bottom. Wow. But there was control gates then. And that went on for, I think, four years I did it. Uh, and we ran from Solitude Station. That was a, a totally different event because all of a sudden everybody was coming out of the woodwork and there was 30, 40, 50, 100 people. And Putting race suits on and stuff probably. <laughs> not so much. There was maybe the top 10 were wearing you know tight pants and stuff. But yeah, there was no real race suits. You know, running the dual slalom in the telly in the later in the uh, semi telemark series got racy you know padded pants and padded sweaters and yeah i remember uh, some of the boys from crested butte you know would would show up and they had all of a sudden don cook was wearing this padded sweater and i was like man he must, <laughs> he must be training or something he must yeah, be getting close to the gates well, and clifton clifton and keith i think they started wearing the you know the padded uh, sweaters anyway not pants but they started wearing knee, knee pads and padded sweaters you know the old solomon knee pads they were big and bold and you know because everybody for a long time a lot of the crested butte folks and i think don and clifton and keith were probably three of the ones i remember the most they had this real low stance right at the gate and they're almost bashing their knee on their skis and my stance was quite a bit different. I was a much taller stance. And some of the other guys, uh, Tommy Carr, Mike Carr, uh, Mark Lance, Dave Hazeltine was another low rider. Mark Hill was a taller guy. But several of us had this taller, more stable stance. And those guys had this stance that just for an instant when they passed the gate, they were dropping that knee just big time, just real aggressively. And their knee was almost smacking the other ski in the back. So they wore knee pads. Uh, that's... It was just a little bit different. Technique was different. And I think those guys were, I didn't know this. And you told me this in our last conversation that, and when I heard uh, the interview with Keith, you know, three or four months ago. With, yeah, Keith Calhoun. Was, yep. Yeah. When I heard that interview with Keith Calhoun, he said he and Clifton were training. I never knew that. No, nope, <laughs> we, we never trained. The rest of us didn't train running gates. We just showed up and did it because we had a background doing it. But and it was just fun. I mean, it was it was great fun. We didn't train to do it. We just did it, and it was fun because we had a little advantage over those people that were just learning to run gates because we had a background in alpine racing. Yeah, well, and, uh, and so the Kamikaze, it sounded f from what I recollect, like from our other conversation, is is basically the Kamikaze Cup was kind of happening, and then it it at some point you and a few other guys – came up with the idea of doing a telemark race correct yes uh, that is correct good memory and good note taking yeah we had uh, an awards party after the telemark or after the kamikaze cup at copper and after a few beers and a couple cocktails and i'm not sure what else <laughs> we, were all, we were sitting in a hot tub and we were saying how much fun it was and there was i don't know three girls and five or six guys and we were saying how much fun it was we ought to do this more often and i said well hell we can do that i mean i can put some things together and you know we have to we'll get together and put a plan together and then we'll make it happen and if you guys i said if you guys are into it i'll put the effort in and we'll just make a series and we could have a whole series of them. we could have races in crusty butte and you know breckenridge copper Keystone, A Basin, Loveland, Vale, Aspen, and they all said, let's do it. And so Bob Kerfman and myself, and I can't remember, there was another woman there that helped us put things together. And everybody had their contacts in different places. So the contact in Crested Butte was Jack Marcial and Craig Hall, and I think it may have been Lucille Lucas in Crested Butte. They helped get things together there. And Borkovic was instrumental in that too, but he wasn't in the party that night, but they, they all got together and put their heads together and they organized it and got it approved. And I did the same thing at a basin and Keystone and 
Breckenridge. Uh, we work with people in Breckenridge. And, of course, we were at Copper, and the Kerfmans were at Copper running the Nordic Center. So they organized that one. And uh, Artie uh, came in, and he was a big part of it. He did all the artwork for all of our posters and promotional material. Oh, and I, didn't, all the, I didn't know that. Yeah, That's cool. Yeah, he was a graphic artist way back then, and you know, back in the late 70s he started making his living as a graphic artist huh. and that was before he moved over to aspen i think he moved to aspen if i'm not mistaken it was either 80 80 81 maybe 82 but um he was a frisco guy and a copper guy before that and then he grew up in here in west denver At any rate we were we we're all good friends and we all just worked together to get it done and Artie came up with this great artwork and we put um sponsorship proposals together and they went out and well, we all did a little bit of that but i had a background in that so we went out and sold sponsorship and yeah, you know, we had ski companies and raymer was donating equipment and Lowe was donating equipment and the manufacturers of skis and boots and poles everybody had something that they were donating and then we did all the local solicitation of businesses and those guys were the ones that benefited the most i think um Every every I think all the sponsors benefited because we're in such a high growth period in tele skiing. Yeah. But the, the local businesses that contributed, you know, like dinner for two or you know, um something like that, uh, even the local ski shops that put something in, uh everybody go that's where that's what we promoted. You know, you gotta visit these shops and or these restaurants and I think there at one time we had about 20 or 30 racers over at the snake river saloon after a keystone and a basin race and just about everybody had dinner and they put up dinner for two which was about 20 bucks a head yeah so they had a 50 dollar cert- gift certificate and there ended up to be 20 people there we all spent a lot of money that night and all had fun and it was it was just a big party with a lot of camaraderie yes. the racing was fun but it wasn't all about who was first it was about who who had the most fun more than anything yeah, it's, it's interesting hearing that from you too because I've I've put on events before and it's kind of funny because you know there's obviously the few people that are competitive and want to win, but I would say there's I don't know what it is about telemark skiers, but it's like it's almost like the the party's primary and the skiing secondary. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like everyone just wants to see each other and like I love these old stories from you guys because you know this is before the internet you know and this is I, I love that there's these little like groups of people in these different cities and you know talking to Keith and talking to you and and some of these other guys it's like you really realize that there's these little communities that you guys got to like you said each person kind of had their network and the 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 race was a time to say hey come up to our place and hang out and you know have some beers and and go free ski and you know, obviously the race is happening too, but I love, I love, I love that. It seems like you guys met a lot of different people from those different areas just through the summit series in the beginning. We did. And that was really the, the funnest, uh, the most fun we could have with our clothes on was getting together during the <laughs> events. You know, when we, when we, after we'd race, we'd get together and there was little rat packs of tele skiers. There'd be 10 or 12 here and 10 or 12 there. And, you know, on the mountain in different places because of different ability levels. But there was, it was just so much fun. We'd get together at the end of the day and we'd do the award ceremony and everybody would show up. I mean, I remember an event at Keystone and I had a bunch of buddies that were alpine skiers, really good alpine skiers, and they all started coming out to the tele races. And it wasn't because, you know, they were good at tele skiing. It was the party atmosphere and the girls and the girlfriends and everybody would come. So all of a sudden it went from being the guys that were, you know, myself and Artie and a few others that that were uh, accomplished tele skiers. All of a sudden, it was everybody was coming out to to the events because it was fun. Yeah, and it was the party that they were coming for. And you know, they got better every week. And you know, they did. <laughs> Not too many of them skied. Well, I'll, I'll say it this way: there was a lot of them that skied tele skied only at the races. Uh, and the rest of the time, they're on alpine skis. But they'd come to the race, and they'd put their tele skis on, and they'd have a hoot, and we'd have a great time, and then they'd hang them up till the next race, and then they'd go to the next race, and they'd put their tele skis on. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. And some of them were cross-country skiers, some of them were alpine skiers, but all of them were there that day for the party and the fun and the camaraderie. And we had gangs of 
Crested Beauties coming up. I say Crested Beauties because Artie was dating a gal that was uh, from Crested Butte. I was dating a gal that was from Crested Butte. And we, there was about four or five other gals from Crested Butte. They, were, they would go to every race consistently. Wow. So there may have been six or eight gals and eight or ten guys. There would probably be, a, on average, 15 to 20 people that would come up from Crested Butte to Summit County for every race. That's so cool, man. That's, and, of course, the same thing happened. We 20 of us would show up, 20, 30 of us would show up from Summit County or maybe more to Crested Butte races. So it was fun. Yeah, it seems like those were the two, from talking to you guys a little bit more, I mean, it's interesting because uh, when I was talking to Keith, too, I mean, Crested Butte is the obvious hot spot, and, and that gets a lot of play from people, you know, like, oh, that's that's where, it, you know, Telemark showed back up in the late 70s. But after talking to you and some other cats, it's like, it's interesting that um, Summit was really pretty influential it seems like too in terms of like you know those were two real hotbeds you know for for telemark skiing in the late 70s so um and I, like you said you guys are going back and forth a lot and and then i mean do you think the more of the roaring fork valley over that way by aspen is that more because people like um our boroughs moved over there and kind of you guys ended up sort of starting events over there how did how did it start spreading into these other areas around colorado specifically i think that's about that's about right you know when Artie went over there um there was a handful of guys over there that were good telly skiers also murray cunningham and Artie and dick jackson and a few other guys and it wasn't all about racing back then it was telemark skiing in, a, in the roaring fork valley was you know backcountry skiing was more prominent and in crested butte that's how it got started with rick borkovec and ski patrol um you know they started so they they started putting on touring skis and learning how to tele so they could do their control routes in crested butte uh easier than on alpine skis and post holy yeah so they would put wax or skins on an old pair of bona 2400s and you know they're packed full of bombs and they go off they go and they were easier to get to these places to do the control routes on nordic skis than it was on alpine skis because they could tour and take their time and it wasn't a slog with heavy equipment on their feet so yeah. that's how it started and uh i think in the roaring fork valley it must have been very very similar for it was just a quiet uh growth for a number of years and then when Artie moved over there um there be there there was a little bit more um well, it was already moved over there, and then they had the guys from. There was a ski company called Trekker. Yep, Trekker skis. I've still got a pair of mine I've, in I've, the garage. I got a couple pair here too. <laughs> yeah, I've got a pair of the original Light Edges in the garage, which was a really narrow, double cambered metal ski, metal edged touring ski with a very stiff flex. It wasn't a very good tele ski, but it was great for touring. You could wax it and you could go uphill, but you had edges in case you needed them. But most people didn't need them um, because they weren't skiing on the hard, icy snow. Yeah. You know, that started with ski area development um, or when we started skiing at the areas more. But at any rate, there was a quiet rumbling in the Roaring Fork Valley uh, that started with backcountry skiers. And when Artie moved over there, I think when we tried to get the very first Aspen race going, that was probably around 1980. I don't think we had an Aspen race until 80 or 80. 80 or 81 and uh that was the first one we had i think they had one at buttermilk the first year and then we went over to snowmass and then it became a, a normal thing then ned ryerson and other people got involved in tele skiing after that i think that was after i retired in 82 um retired from tele racing and moved to direct back to durango and at any rate um that was a little bit slower to come along but you know, when it did, there was still a hardcore following of tele skiers in Aspen. It just wasn't as prominent as Summit County and Crested Butte were. And I would say Crested Butte probably takes the prize for having the most tele skiers, the most young people that were into tele skiing, uh, because Summit County had a very diverse alpine population and there was a lot bigger, I'm going to say it was almost like a cult following in Crested Butte. Everybody wanted to tele. Yeah, You'd go down there, and there would be, you know, more tele skiers on the mountain than alpine skiers. It seemed like really? all the locals, all the locals for some time, seemed like all the locals were tele skiing. 
That's so, that's, oh man, I wish I could see that. That would have been a, a fascinating time to be around it. Cause yeah, it's like s- kind of this thing that popped up. And like you said, Rick Borkovec obviously was influencing people to like get on it. And then it's interesting to see the, where the race thing kind of came. And it makes sense talking to you that racing kind of came into the picture because of your guys' background. It wasn't like necessarily, uh, you know, you didn't necessarily come from like a backcountry skiing side. You were a racer, and then you guys started telemarking, and it's like, hey, why don't we put a race together? <laughs> you know, so and obviously that keeps you know it definitely diversified because telemark racing still it's crazy. There's World Cup. That what do you think about that? That's I don't even think to ask you that. Is I mean, do you realize there's World Cup telemark racing now? I do, and I I, I don't want to say anything other than it's probably the one of the least efficient ways to ski on really hard snow <laughs> <laughs> that I can imagine. Um, I mean, I, I watched, I went to the world cup when I was at Keystone about 10 years ago. And I met one of the guys that was on the U S telemark team at the top of the U S telemark team ladder. And we had a great conversation, but I stood there like a gatekeeper stands there and I watched these guys come down and I'm thinking, man, it's just like alpine skis, but they're putting one foot in front of the other, and it's probably not a very efficient way to stand on two planks. Yeah. Only, you know, it, it's taking nothing away from the athleticism and the desire and the shape these guys are in to do it because the forces are huge. Oh, yeah. But, you know, it's just amazing that, that it's come that far. Now, you know, when we were all doing it at a very, very high level, and the best we could do was, you know, with the limitations that we had with equipment and personal skill, um, it, it was different. Um, the courses were, you know, they weren't a minute and 20 seconds or a minute and 10 seconds. There was no jump in the middle. There was no rondelle at the bottom. And, you know, they had to add all those things because just straight tele racing, like we did it back in the day was, you know, 25, 35 seconds on a course and you ran each course right and left blue and red and then your combined times at the end of the day then we'd add it at the end of the season we always had a uh a qualifying and then a elimination double elimination so you get two runs and then if you won those the combined time on those two runs move to the next round just like what we did in alpine pro ski so it was the same format at the end of the season in the finals yeah but that, be- before that it was you know it was just everybody get out gets out there and has some fun but yeah how it how it came to be racing was just i had the experience putting on events like that and a few other people did and we thought that's something we know let's just do that and see if and see if, you know people will come out we promoted it we had posters and you know flyers and radio advertising and gosh and all the sponsors took care of us it was great yeah. Well, that, that, some of that, um, when you were talking about trucker and stuff, there's some, there was some really cool brands. I mean, I, I think I told you, I mean, I collect a lot of old stuff. My shop's kind of like a little mini museum. And, um, it's funny cause when you brought up trucker, I, I didn't actually, that I, that was before my time and had gone away already. But people, when I first started collecting, they're like, you got to get trucker skis. And I was, it took me, a, <laughs> it took me a few years to look for trucker and honestly phoenix came out of trucker i think right or something like that That, yeah uh, that's right yeah yeah prior to that when you saw trucker you know they were down here in boulder they took over i think and i may be mistaken on the exact fact but there was a ski company called love it l-o-v-e-t-t and they made nordic skis and they were based in boulder and there's a couple guys, uh, I think, bought the presses in the factory, and that was Al Lazé, Al Burnham, Al Lazé, and Jay. What was Jay's last name? Jay Lazan. Jay Lazan. And those three guys formed a partnership, and they bought the old they, – they had worked with Trucker, and then they wanted to move Al Burnham, I think, when AB went back to Aspen. And they wanted to do something to resurrect and put together something that was a, um, a better ski than what was out there. And so they 
bought the rights from Trucker and they stopped making Trucker and they moved the presses and everything up into the airport business park in Aspen and started making Phoenix skis. Artie was a uh, primary influencer in that one because he knew those guys pretty well. And he did all their artwork and their graphics. And it was rising from the ashes of Trucker Ski Company. That's how Phoenix came to be. That's, that's how the name <laughs> that's how the name came to be and everything else. And they made some really good quality skis. They had two different models, a hard snow racy model and a soft snow touring type model for huh. powder. Wow, that's so that's so cool. Yeah, it's 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 cool. Like some of those old companies, like um, just to think back. Like, and I'm sure you dealt with, you know, like you're saying, you're trying to get events going and you're finding sponsorships. So, yeah, that's what I think about. You know, um, I guess 1980. I mean, so you boot wise, were you guys like using Galibiers or was it like Galibier was the first good double boot? And then Castlinger made one that they were importing. Alpineer and Crested Butte had them. The Alpineer and Frisco had them. And Castlinger and Galibiers. And before that, we were using Vasque boots, and those were singles. Oh, yeah, the brown but, Vasque boots. Yeah. Yep. And then uh, there was a Nerona started making, importing some boots from Norway, and that was a single leather boot. And that was pretty good. It had a fairly stiff sole. And the soles got thicker, and the boots got better. And you know, that's where that whole evolution towards uh, the Stein comps and uh, that Keith uh, pioneered, that's where that came from. You know, and everybody was doing something different, experimenting with how they could get more control and more power to the edge of the ski. And, you know, that was a li big limitation because we had such torsional flex in the toes of a 75 millimeter boot at the time. Yeah. So when they would take these old Alpine ski boots, lace up Alpine ski boots into a cobbler, and he cut the old soles off and put a new Vibram sole on with a 75 millimeter toe. All of a sudden, they had this super stiff <laughs> boot, but they had to break it in because it didn't didn't flex at the toe. Those right? things are so stiff too. Like for people that haven't seen a leather Alpine boot, I mean, they're like yeah. they're stiff, stiff. You know, it's pretty crazy so to I, think. I I don't know this, but I I have a feeling that Keith and and uh, Clifton and Don Cook probably soak their boots in water so they could get them to flex you know mm -hmm. so they could break them in so they could break them in but because they were hard to get broken in i mean even though they put a, cut the old sole off which was just rigid like an alpine boot mm -hmm. they cut the old sole off and put this flexible sole on there they still had this heavy heavy duty welt on them that was the original leather welt that you know went all the way through from the toe all the way back to the heel yeah. And there was no flex design. It wasn't designed to flex. It was designed not to flex. So when they had to bend at the ball of the foot, they had to really break them in. And I wouldn't be surprised if they, you know, got their boots wet and skied in them, you know, that way. But I don't know that they did. But I would imagine that might have been. A, yeah. No, I'm on the phone. Oh, sorry. Um, anyway, I think that might have been that idea might have run through their mind to, to have something that they had to break them in before they went out and went to the races. Because otherwise, they were limited to putting their feet side by side. Yeah. You, if you couldn't put your weight on the ball of the foot, you couldn't because you, know, you couldn't flex the boot. Yeah, you know, you, that's actually you couldn't really tell. You. Yeah, that's an interesting point. They must have had to come up with something to break those in. Yeah. And yeah, okay, that paints a better picture for me. Yeah, in terms of like which skis you guys were on, you know, and and I'm starting to I'm starting to see, you know, more of like, yeah, the Galibier, the snob bindings, I think was the ones that most people a lot of uh I don't know if you remember which bindings you were getting on on those first Europas you had or any of that, but I, I do and they were uh I wish they were snobs. I wish I had that by me, but I didn't. And they were hard to come by. Snobs There's were? Not many, yeah, they weren't. No, not many of the shops in Summit County had them. Right. And so we were getting them when we went on trips to Crested Butte, but we couldn't get them. They, were, they would sell out because all the Crested Butte folks would buy them all up. How funny. But we were skiing on old Rodafels, you know, the anodized aluminum blue ones with little wire bales and oh, little yeah. flat bales that poked in each a little yep. recessed knob on each side. And, you know, I remember skiing in the backcountry on a tour one time of the Crested Butte and skiing the Red Lady with, geez, there was about six or eight of us. And right in the middle of a turn, I just put a lot of torque on it. And my bale just blew up. It was gone. And, of course, 
I ate it big time and had to basically tape my boot back to the binding to get out. And uh, it was the end of the tour. God. But we were skiing beautiful backcountry conditions in 18 inches of powder. And I struggled down the last 40 or so, 50 turns to the valley floor. And <laughs> then we tour- toured out with taping it back up and just, you know, just taking duct tape and putting all around the binding and the, over the top of the boot to hold it on in place. Oh, man. It wasn't, it wasn't, it was effective at getting out, but it wasn't uh, ideal. Some of the but, fixes. Yeah, we were, oh, go ahead. We we're skiing on just uh, anything that we could. And the snob binding was very, very durable. It had a really heavy, thick bale, as you know. Mm hmm. And that little clip at the front, and once you had enough tension on it and put that clip on there, it, it didn't didn't easily come off. You had to work to get it off. Yeah, it's crazy. Some of the the breakages. Uh, yeah, it just reminded me of another funny fix that uh, back then you could actually buy like a replace uh, a ski tip replacement. Do you remember those? I do. I have one in my backcountry kit always oh you still have one no way well, i still have it but yeah, oh, okay it's, it's nordic nordic dimensions right but i still have it i just don't ski with it because i don't ski on those skinny skis in the backcountry uh, anymore yeah i know <laughs> someone finally brought one in at like one it's like this old yellow one exactly and and yeah. uh it's kind of got those teeth you know so if you snapped it, your tip off you could kind of gra- grip these teeth onto the front of your broken ski and it was perfect for that you slide that broken tip in there and the teeth grab it and you can slide out. Yeah, you can get out with the tip. That's so funny. <laughs> I I love old stuff like that. It's super fun to like see kind of what the thought process was and what people. No, the, yeah, the the first aid kit for backcountry touring back there in those days included that and matches and steel wool and extra baskets. Pole baskets were a big thing. If you lost your pole basket in the backcountry on a tour, you're screwed. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And so we did we did all those kind of things and it was the things that you didn't think about that you broke that all of a sudden next trip you had one or two. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, um I guess just to kind of um I guess after after the summit series kind of wrapped up, you you ended up going back to Durango, right? And then um and that was kind of like in the early 80s you kind of wrapped up doing stuff with summit series yourself and then I, it continued on, right? The Summit Series kind of through the 80s and stuff? It did. I don't know how long after 82 it was around, maybe to 84, 85. I'm not certain. I moved back to Durango uh, to run the Nordic Center down there and <clears throat> got out of racing uh, entirely. I put on races down there. We had business league races and we had a little telemark series course sponsored us down there and there was more activity back then uh that was 82 83 84 and they sponsored course did that on the mountain stuff because they could dispense beer at the award ceremony and everybody went to the parties and then they also uh said well we'll we'll do the a nordic series too but you have to have our cohort in durango did the nordic series so coca-cola did the nordic series <laughs> and, and coors did the telemark series oh wow and they worked together and they were great i mean it was great to have sponsors that you know were promoting the sport and they promoted the the business league up there too at purgatory and so coors had the business league and the telemark series and coca-cola had the cross-country series and it was, it was a lot of fun and they had the kids program and it was great. I think Coca-Cola in, uh, sponsored the adaptive program there as well. Wow. But it was, yeah, it, when I moved back to Durango, um, I just, I, I had tapped out on tele racing. It was over for me. And it wasn't because of injury or anything like that. I had uh, just burnt the, burnt the wick to the bottom. And I had an incident in one of the races I think I alluded to last time we talked that uh, it was unfortunate but there was no control and it was just something that happened and i ended up getting i think 11 penalty points and the guy I was racing against could not put his weight on the ball of his foot so he had all these parallel turns and i got all the points and it was just a mistake oh yeah you said gatekeepers they, yeah, they gatekeeper's mixed. mistake but 
they wouldn't change it because all the gatekeepers had gone home and nobody knew. <laughs> That's right. You t- you said you said they they basically mixed you guys up and he was racing on a pair of like Ramers or something like AT bindings and then yeah. he ended up going, a- he ended up winning a trip for two to Mexico or something. <laughs> yeah, well, it cost me the trip. He didn't win the trip, but it cost me the trip to Mexico oh, and Artie ended, Artie ended up winning it, but that was it was a fun race and we had a great time and then we get to the award ceremony and I got all the penalty points and he didn't get any. And I was like, Oh man, that's a bummer. But you know, they couldn't do anything about it because all the, all the gatekeepers were volunteers. And at the end of the day, they'd been standing around on a cold snowy day and they all went home. <laughs> There's no one to talk to and, and verify they, well, what they happened. Couldn't con- they couldn't convene 15 gatekeepers and say, do, can you vouch for this? So they just said, no, we just got to leave it. And so they did. Oh, and man. I was like, Oh, we got to do a better job. And that's when Rick hum, I think really got involved in organizing a lot of the details. Rick Hum was a, a backcountry skier, a good friend of ours from Summit County, Breckenridge. And uh, he had a, a lot of experience with, he was an IT guy, but he had a lot of experience working with the computer and statistics and facts and those kind of things. And he really looked at everything. He said, well, we've got to do a better job of doing this and this and this. And then he also helped us with finances. But, um, great guy and that's that's when it really became a little bit more uh i'm gonna say a little bit more serious and uh, the fun had gone away for me so i thought well you know it's fun to put on races for other people and it's not all about the racing it's all about their camaraderie and the fun so when i walked away from it i didn't look back it wasn't i wasn't uh i was disheartened for about two hours that night that the, of the party and then i thought well nothing you can do about it but make it better next time so they kept going and they did make it better so some of telemarks just kept going from 82 to it was probably that was my last race there in 80 81 82 so it probably went on for another three or four years That's before it finally dissolved oh. but then somebody else took then somebody else took over and it became a big thing again scott powers got into it in the 90s and I know there was other guys up here in Summit County. Um, there was then the Breckenridge Bump Buffet took off. There oh, was yeah. events. I was going to bring that, that up. Came, yeah, events that came after the Summit Telemark Series that had nothing to do with racing, but it was freestyle and fun and big packs of telly rats running around the mountain, skiing around the mountain and having fun. Yeah, the Bump Buffet was a big one, and that I just saw that they had. I think they just had their thirtieth anniversary. It was probably. It could have been thirty five. It might last year. It was either it was either thirty five or forty because they actually reached out to me and told me that they were bringing that back. I think there was a, there was an obvious gap towards the end, you know. But that might have been Scott Yule or somebody like that that I think organized that first one. Yeah, man. Yeah, that's actually that's if 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 uh, if anybody's listening out there and you put on early bump buffets, I would love to talk to you. Because <laughs> yeah, you know, if you're in Breckenridge still, you got to get a hold of Josh. <laughs> yeah, I, lo- I love I love some of the yeah it's, Summit County. Actually, the more the more I'm learning from you guys, Summit County actually there's there's a lot of important detail of you know like the stuff we're talking about that early festival um bump buffet um the first big uh, big mountain comps actually came out of there as well later on in the i think that's 90, right 96 <laughs> i think was the first one in birth had passed that's right so yeah and i know that uh, when i started the tele skiing instructional programs at a basin in 1978 um nobody you know there there was nobody teaching tele in the county really uh, organized at the ski resorts. So I was working with Keystone, but Keystone, you know, I would go up on the mountain and take a beginner over there and work on the hill uh, at the beginner hill at Keystone. And then they'd say, well, can we go up, up the mountain? And the best place to ski up the mountain or on the mountain was a basin because they, they kind of shied away from us, letting us on the mountain at Keystone. They didn't know it. Uh, they didn't know what it was like or what it was. And the, management at a basin was much more accommodating so we i would take clients up to a basin and teach them how to tele ski on the beginner terrain uh, after experiencing the beginner slopes at keystone um, and then it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and geez and the, when i came back in 2000 i was recruited to come back over to to uh, run the high alpine series at a basin and the telemark programs 
Hmm. And we were running. Chris Anthony was doing the Alpine side. Oh yeah, I know Chris. And I and I was doing the Tele side. And uh, I had I hired a staff: Scott Powers, Mike Mattern, a few other people. Leslie worked for me. Um, oh, Leslie Matt Ross. Ro- yeah, Matt Ross and Leslie. Oh, and, so you, oh, wow! I didn't even realize you knew knew each other. That's crazy. Yeah, and Luke Miller. Uh, Luke, I know all, Luke too. Yeah, so they all worked at for at a Mason for me for a couple of years. And then <clears throat> Leslie, uh, Leslie started doing her own thing more than working at a Mason. So she had a different uh, plan because She's, her babes in the backcountry really babe, took off. Yeah, and, and so she did babes in, babes in the backcountry clinics there um instead in in place of what we were doing with the high alpine series and then we just started doing clinics uh, tele clinics and on any given weekend we'd have 30 or 40 or even 50 people this is up through 2006 from 2000 through 2006 show up on a weekend we did them every other week and it was 40 bucks for the day and we did a three-hour clinic and a party and raffle at the end of the day Everybody went home with something, and it was just a fun thing. And everybody learned to ski better. And then it was just clinics. It was nothing to do with racing or competition at all. Yeah. Wow, that's so cool that that you uh, crisscrossed with that era. I mean, because the, uh, the Nat, Nat and Leslie, Nat obviously started the big mountain competitions. Luke was one of the first... Um, he was in a lot of the early tough guy productions movies that Nat was running. And then, uh, exactly. and then also the unparalleled movies, which is funny. Cause that's kind of where I came into kind of working in and around telemark was watching guys like Luke and Nat and, uh, Caleb Malamed. Uh, who? Caleb Malamed. Mm, I don't know. That one. He was a buddy of Luke's from Boulder. Oh, okay. Yeah. Luke was like the first, punk rock telemark skier that i ever knew <laughs> he was the hard charger for yeah sure. man oh man that's cool to hear those names and that's cool that that you guys chris like cross paths and like work together because i mean babes in the backcountry was a huge thing and they used to fill those class i mean it's it's hard to imagine because now i'll tell people like that that kind of stuff existed and they're you know we're filling up tele clinics and stuff and it's like kind of far-fetched for people that are just getting into it they're like i can't even find a lesson now you know and i'm like back in the day i mean it was like there was all sorts of stuff going on like that so yeah and you think about it wasn't that long ago i mean 2006 is when i walked away from a basin yeah and they were still they still continued through 2010 drawing a crowd and really promoting it heavily and you know now they offer something but it's not the same as it was right yeah and there's there's actually a there's 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 kind of a new generation of people that are a A basin is a spot where um, there's like a group called telemark Colorado now. And they're, you know, they're all younger guys and they're kind of getting parking lot groups together and little, I met those guys last year. They're a couple of, they are a couple high energy guys. Oh yeah. It's all, it's a bunch of young guys that have high energy, kind of like I used to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I laugh. I laugh because I still have the energy, but it's uh, focused in a different direction now. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's yeah. that's cool, man. Well, thank, thank you so much for walking us through that history, man. That's It means a lot to me just to be able to talk to guys like you and, and – you, you guys every time i talk to you know you or keith or i mean all the names you name i, I start thinking i'm like where are all, i need to start tapping into where all the, these guys are going to start getting phone calls from me and be like who is this guy what why does he want to talk about these parties and and races that we used to do but um well if you haven't yet reach out to Artie. he would be another one uh, I, that would be great to talk to about those days because he had a lot of he was very influential in that time too like i said if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have had the promotional materials that we did to promote it. And he was instrumental in doing that because he was a graphic artist and, you know, he had a lot of contacts as well. And we all did, but we all pulled our resources and we pulled together and we pulled it off as a team. And it was a great thing. And, and it was the Kerfman brothers and <clears throat> myself and Artie. And then it became other people that were involved in the sport. Gene Dayton, that's another one you got to get all of his, his telemark read the, the Telemark returns events in Breckenridge were the first big festivals and he's still there running the Nordic center in Breckenridge, Breckenridge Nordic center. And you could probably look him up at the Breckenridge Nordic center and just be a great interview because he's just a super guy. And hell, he raised two kids to be on the Olympic team, Nordic and Nordic combined. Yeah, no, that, 
I, I would love to talk to to him and Art. I actually, yeah, I've, I've tried to get a hold of Art too, so we might have to combine forces and try to track him down. I'll do some and, additional and research. There you go. And you know, Rick Borkovic is still in the Roaring Fork. He's in the Roaring Fork Valley. He moved out of Crested Butte. Must have been about that time in the early '80s. Um, was married and had kids, and they moved over to Carbondale, I think. And I believe he's either in Carbondale or Basalt or Glenwood. Yeah. That, that would be another interesting interview. Yeah, I, and that's that's what's so fun talking to you guys is I end up coming out of these conversations having like, it's like it, all of a sudden the puzzle pieces are starting to kind of show up on the table. And it's interesting to hear you guys talk and talk to, you know, guys from Crested Butte from Summit County and start to see – you know, where these pieces fit because it's pretty, it's pretty cool to see for someone like me that, you know, came along later and is interested in the history to see it kind of all plug together and kind of match up. It's really, really fun. Well, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, when we did this, we had no, no idea that it would evolve the way it did, but within a year or two, all of a sudden the Wasatch series popped up. Oh, yeah. And there were some really good skiers and watch up Wasatch series that started showing up. And then it was the uh, Northwest series and it was a series in Montana and uh, Whit Thurlow was, uh, came down and all of a sudden he showed up and became a, uh, just an incredible uh, racer. And the guys in Utah, there were some really hot guys out there too. So all of a sudden the racing thing, uh, there was guys that showed up that nobody had ever heard of before that all of a sudden they get into racing and it was a big deal. Yeah. A lot of fun. So it, it appealed to a certain element, but it didn't start as uh, the intention wasn't just competition. That was just the only avenue that we know knew how to uh, put on. <laughs> yeah. Basically so, that, that was like the default to get people together. And, and yeah, yeah. No, I love that. We knew, we knew how to put on a, a race. So we put on a race and people just showed up. They didn't <laughs> all show up to race, but they showed up. Oh, I love that, man. It was a lot of fun. Well, Josh, thanks a lot for making the call and uh, taking the time. It's it's always interesting to hear the stoke that still is out there for Telly skiing. You know, I hear the people say that you know, Telly's dead, and I don't see a lot of it nearly what we used to see. And I've got a, a buddy you know at Jim Shaw at yep. Winter Park that uh, has been trying to get me back out there and. I think this year, this year, if the lifts, if the bull wheels spin, I'll probably get on my telly skis again for the first time in 14, 15 years. I love that. I'll, uh, I'll make yeah. sure I want to be there. <laughs> that, that would be fun. We, we would have a lot of yucks on the lift about, you know, what took you so long? <laughs> yeah, no. And, and, and I, I love, uh, yeah, the, the, the stoke is real. And I know, I know people will eat. That's what's so crazy is like being able to, to find guys like you and talk about this and give some history to it and kind of context to where it came from and kind of names with faces. Honestly, people email me about talking to guys like you and it's, it's rad and all over the world too. That's what's so crazy is even for me, I'm like, wow, this is it's fascinating. I mean, I even got a package uh, today from Russia and there's this whole crew over in Russia. I mean, it's not a big group, but they're fired up, man. <laughs> and it's like, you, you know, it's so crazy to see how far and wide this reaches and how many different countries there's telemark skiers in these days. So anyway. when we first, when we first went to <clears throat> Norway and Sweden and Finland, uh, I was with the demo team back in 1983, 88, and we did demos on the mountain as well as you know cross country skiing. We were we were just as much students as as we were instructors because the Norwegians and the Swedes and the Finns were master technicians, and we were you know basically trying to write the book on how to teach it better. You know, mm. and that was great. But when we when we put skis on and went up the hill and came down, their jaws dropped, and they thought, "Oh wow, <laughs> how do you do how?" How does that work? Because they hadn't seen anybody doing it actively. You know, yes, it's it, it was pioneered and invented over there, but they had not. It had not been practiced for many, many years, other than the occasional touring turn. You know, right. So when when they heard about it and then they saw us doing it, they were just fascinated. And when we went to Italy in 1983, 
there was a whole herd of the media from all the Scandinavian countries and Central Europe, the French, the Italians, the Swiss, the Swedes. Everybody was there looking at our equipment, taking pictures, close-ups. Japanese were there with their cameras taking close-ups of the bindings and the skis and the uh, Phoenix skis with cracked edges. And it was just fascinating <laughs> stuff, you know. And, uh, and then all of a sudden the demand for uh, teaching and a progression and all that got a little bit higher. And it went up and up and up. And that was you – know, it started in 80 when we were first there and then – 83 it became a big demonstration it was a it was well received and it kind of exploded uh in europe after that yeah i love that man well josh thanks a million thanks so much man i really appreciate it and uh thanks for taking us back in time and helping us see what was going on back then i, I it was awesome talking to you uh likewise and i'm glad i can still go back in time it's like yesterday <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it again in the future i'm sure well, take care. Thanks again, and uh, stay safe out there. I will, man. Talk to you later. All right. Take care. How you can support us is you can always support the podcast by making a donation of your choice at the link paypal.me slash freehealllife. Uh, you can always check out freehealllife.com. We want to be your preferred telemark shop this winter, and we're always available to answer questions. Uh and whatnot, you can reach out directly to us at customer service at freehealllife.com. Uh, go to our website. We're going to be starting to stock stuff for the upcoming season in the months of September and October, and can't wait to have that gear back available. So make sure to keep an eye out for that. Uh, you can check out articles on telemarksgear.com. You can always email us at podcast at freehealllife.com. And we really appreciate your support, everybody, for listening out there, sharing the podcast with your friends, rating, reviewing us, watching our content. It means the world to me and our crew, and we couldn't do it without you. So thanks for listening, and until next week, spread telemark always, my friends.